Hello, and welcome to Hidden Levers War Room for February 2019. Today, we're going to talk about U.S. housing and how we may have entered a period of the blues for U.S. housing and uh, real estate markets in the United States. My name is Praveen Gunta, and I'll be joined by my partner in crime, Raj Udeshi. We're the co-founders of Hidden Levers. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started now on the topic of U.S. housing. The war room, for those of you who don't know, who've never been on a war room before is our monthly webinar where we talk about the scenarios we've created uh, and we focus on topics that we think are uh, of import at the moment and uh, we update our scenarios update the audience on new scenarios and scenarios that we've updated and, and built out and changed uh, over time through this monthly process as well today we're going to talk about u.s real estate as we mentioned we're going to show you our updates to our U.S. housing scenario. Uh, in addition, though, uh, up front, we wanted to hear the audience's feedback on uh, real estate modeling. So a new feature that we've been working on and that we're hoping to release soon. But before we do that, we wanted to get your feedback. So we'll be asking some questions about that via poll through uh, GoToWebinar. And uh, we're also interested, if, if any of you are interested in beta testing that functionality, then uh, we'll ask you to shoot us a note either in the question panel in uh, GoToWebinar and we'll take down uh, your name or uh, or if you feel free to uh, shoot us an email to info at hiddenlevers.com as well. So definitely looking for, for advisors who are interested in doing that. All right, well, let's go ahead and get Started. So first, the skinny. Why are we talking about U.S. housing today? A couple of different reasons. Starting with, if we roll back the clock a little bit, back to 2017, 2018, everybody recalls, or everybody actually, now that we're dealing with it here in early 2019, we're dealing with 2018 taxes, right? So now we're in tax season, and uh, Many homeowners are coming to terms with changes in the tax law. That would, uh, in, in some cases, in so-called high salt states, so high state and local income tax, or state and local tax states, uh, the, the nature of deductions has changed significantly in that for some uh, residents of those states, the higher standard deduction obviously benefits them. But for those folks that are in high uh, state and local tax regions, if you're a homeowner, if you have high property taxes and or high income taxes, as um, some of your clients will, then uh, then that's obviously a negative impact from a tax standpoint. So we've got the red state movers uh, trucks there, but that's that exodus from, you know, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, just, just to name a few, but from major cities with uh, higher prices and high property taxes you know, that there is some of that relative shift being seen in market. At the same time, you know, the S&P is rebounding, but housing markets seem like they are starting to soften a little bit. And we'll talk about, okay, what are the reasons for that? Is that all due to interest rates? Are there any other factors at play? Uh, and, you know, what do the trend lines look like? So some of those, we've talked about the property tax impact. All of this really, we felt, made it right to get out ahead. The news media isn't talking about housing so much right now, but we felt it important to get ahead of this topic and to ask the question, well, if housing, you know, could be at risk now, if the steady 5% per year gains we've been seeing year after year, uh, should those come to an end? What does that mean for equity markets? What does that mean for the economy at large? Uh, how large a risk is that is, is one of the questions that we would seek to answer today. Is it, you know, are we in 2006 right now? Or is it something milder, something less impactful? Before we jump into some of that detail, though, we want to take a look at where this content is on Hidden Levers. So let's do that. So I'll jump in and take a look first at our scenario library, where the housing scenario is is down at the bottom. You'll see it there updated just today, in fact. 
And if I drill into it, we're going to put today's content in terms of the um, presentation will be here uh, after today's broadcast as well as the, the recording. But we've got our new scenarios here. And we'll go, in, go into these in greater detail uh, later, but just want to note that this is how you would get to the scenario. You'll see it under U.S. Housing. Um, if you were to go under categories, it falls under domestic. And so there it is. So that's one aspect. The bigger piece, though, that we wanted to really look at today insofar as what's changed with our modeling is this. So I have a, um, a George Jetson client here who's got a portfolio which has some real estate in it. And I wanted to take a look at that. And so here's that real estate, here's that portfolio with real estate in it. And let's look first at some of the capabilities in terms of stress testing and how that works with a real estate portfolio. We've got a couple of poll questions for you uh, in terms of how you'd like to see real estate represented within the system. Right now we see this portfolio has uh, 123 Future Valley and 123 Rental Way. I'll start by editing the portfolio and we'll just show what those look like here in the portfolio editor. So we see that, first of all, there's a real estate button on the right hand panel here amongst the different types of assets you can add to a portfolio. If I hit edit on one of them, we'll see it's pretty straightforward. Give it a name or an address, choose the real estate index that you want to use to proxy the value. And so here we've added all of the uh, Case-Shiller Top 20 Metro Indices. We also have a commercial real estate index, a national commercial real estate index, as well as the national home price index for um, for those who don't find a particular market is, is a great fit, or for whom commercial real estate, if that's the nature of the investment, that may, may be a better fit. So we've got those indices in there. And then in terms of what else do you need to enter? Well, a, a, an estimate of the current value of the property, mortgage balance, if any, mortgage rate, and then cap rate. And if you scroll over it, you can see a detail of what that means. But that's really the, um, effectively the net yield, if you want to think of it that, uh, on the asset. So cap rate, as you can see there, it's operating income of the property divided by current market value. If you're a um, homeowner and this is your home, then that would be zero or you would just leave it empty. Contrast that to a rental property where I put this rental in Charlotte. And here I've got the same $500,000 value, but I've got a much larger mortgage balance. And I've got my mortgage interest rate and I've got a 6% cap rate. So this one is generating yield or generating income. So that's how we set them up. Pretty straightforward. And now let's take a look. Okay, how does that model out? So we start by, we start by looking, you know, high level at what the scenarios look like here. But then let me drill into a particular scenario. Let's take a recession, for instance. And we can see that real estate is modeled just like, just like equities, just like fixed income, like any other type of investment. And I think that the key point that's worth making here, um, as I say change, you know, make the scenario a little bit less negative, because that rental property has uh, more leverage, this one was an 80% LTV. It was a 400,000 mortgage on a $500,000 property. And this was a $100,000 mortgage on a $500,000 property. So we can see that you know, the system in, in modeling this is really taking into account that leverage. And if you wonder, you know, oh, I've taken the S&P all the way into the positive, why are these guys still negative? Well, that's because they are principally moving based on U.S. home prices down here, as you as might not be surprising. So if I were to move home prices up and then maybe rates, you know, these are the kinds of things that will tend to impact real estate a lot more so, right? Rising rates are not going to be good for real estate, but rising home prices are going to be good. So the whole model here works very similarly to how it does for any other asset class, except we also take into account the leverage that comes from having a mortgage. That just gives you a, a quick touch on that. Uh, love to hear feedback or questions uh, about what we've done there. And then the other piece that I wanted to explore before we get into the overall presentation topic today. And here I'm going to quickly pop into the poll questions. So we've seen a little bit about how we can model real estate. 
Currently, though, on asset classes inside of a portfolio, so the vast majority of this particular portfolio is real estate, and it's just being classified as other for the moment. So let me launch the poll. And hopefully you can see that right now. And if you guys can take a second to just vote on how you think real estate should be modeled, should it be an alternative, other, like we've got it now, I think we didn't leave that as a choice, but alternative, fixed income, or is it a new asset, is it a real estate asset class? Uh, you know, that's really the question. How do you guys view it? And we'll just give that a few more seconds so everybody who's interested can tell you a response. All right, so we've got some responses on that poll, so I'm going to close that one now. And one more question for you. Which has to do with how should real estate be treated within the user interface? Right now, as you saw, it's just entered as another type of investment within kind of our portfolio editing. And so how do we want to treat it? Of course, it's true that, you know, even within, uh, if I go back to the client that owns this portfolio, George Jetson, one thing that we've done is we just kind of put it in a separate portfolio here, separate from the 401k, separate from other holdings. So that's possible today, but, you know, really just that question of how, do, how, do we, how should we split it out? How should we best, best handle that? All right, just a few more seconds on that topic, and then we'll jump back into our presentation. While we're uh, waiting for that to wrap up, I'll just go ahead and put the call out now. If any of you have questions on what um, on what you can, um, whether you're interested in being a beta tester on this real estate functionality that we briefly demoed here, or if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And let's jump back into into our presentation. All right, so now that we've talked about our real estate modeling a little bit, let's First, touch on hey, hey. the takeaway. Hey, Raj, you with us? Yeah, yeah I am with you. with you. Excellent. Well, if you'd like to take us into the takeaways now, we touched on real estate modeling for a bit. Let's talk takeaways, and then we'll jump into the detail content. Can we talk about why it's ripe? We did. Okay, great. Well, the main thing, if you want to learn about, uh, you know, why, why the housing blues and not just uh, the, the great up-and-up -up economy, you know, the divergence with housing is crazy, um, how it's not participating. And so really it, it's about how much it's shrunk. The biggest picture on that page is the tiny little home and real estate as a sector has shrunk as a part of the GDP. Uh, even at its uh, highest these days, uh, not really more than 6% of GDP in booms. Uh, currently a little right around 4% and trending down um, in terms of uh, what we what we want to blame it's interest rates and that's the media all day every day uh, and to the point where uh, Jerome Powell is kind of a, an embattled figure sometimes now and the the bad guy making housing uh, unaffordable or mortgage rates uh, uh, sky high not even true don't don't buy that for a second the interest rates are not really to blame for the long term housing blues uh, it's a much bigger deal than that we'll explain that in today's session. Uh, you know, a lot of you are looking at homes as uh, a investment uh, or for your clients, maybe a second home, maybe they're going to retire and sell that home or something. If, if there is this notion, along with the poll question, of housing as an investment or home purchase as capital accumulation, which it has been since the end of World War II, 
right? Get that 30 year old mortgage and um, uh, keep going. And then it pr produces the income I need for my, for my retirement when I sell it or some reverse mortgage, et cetera. You know, th just decouple that notion because the, the, the humanity, at least in the United States, it doesn't work like that now. Um, that's, that's the home prices have gone up a lot in some areas and that's benefiting uh, the residents that participated in it from those, uh, those days of the fifties till now, but that's not where it is anymore. You know, if you have a big nugget of money and you want to put it in somewhere, a home purchase may be right, but, uh, it, as an investment, it probably, there's probably other, other things to put it in that will do better for you long-term. So that's that. That's the takeaways. If you don't have time for us, other, other than that, I, I suggest you stay back to you, Praveen. All right. So let's, jump now into a detailed pulse check on the real estate sector and, and let's look at it first in the long-term view and then we will drill into what's been going on over the last year so i think you know in terms of both new home sales and housing starts uh you'll see some of these metrics covered in the media we've drawn some lines in here to kind of indicate what the floor over the last several decades has been in terms of sales you know and also housing starts and then what the average is here on new home sales and, and what we can see is that we're kind of in the middle so new home sales did recover from that absolute low in 2010 2011 after this huge slide during the financial crisis uh, but it certainly hasn't recovered all the way back up to the rates of not to the peak so to be clear we're not saying it should get back to the peak but it hasn't recovered to a level that's sort of even a median Actually, even if you look at sort of the 750,000 mark, which is below that red line, we're not quite there yet either. So there's still uh, room we haven't covered yet on the new home sales front. But then when you look on the housing starts front, it's more stark because here we're slumping back down very recently, but we never at, at the peak during the post-crisis rise in housing starts, we're still below roughly 1.5 million, which would be sort of a rough mid midpoint line over the long term. Uh, you know, forget about getting over 2 million housing starts, which is where we were not just during the um, 2006, 2005 timeframe, but also going back in history, back into the 70s. Uh, we have hit those kinds of numbers before and even briefly in the 80s a few times. So those kinds of numbers are, you know, out of the question at this point. We had thought, you know, and I think the last time a couple of years ago that we had been observing this trend, the thought was that housing starts would get back up to roughly the 1.5 million range. That hasn't happened. And we'll look into some of the reasons that that, that, that hasn't happened, you know, in terms of affordability and otherwise, but, uh, but that hasn't gotten there yet. In terms of home prices though, and this is on a log scale, so looking at sort of long-term growth trends from a home price perspective, there's a lot of talk that home prices, let's say, are grossly overvalued. And this particular, uh, trend line looking at it this way and incidentally if you look at log stock prices and things like that if you look at long-term trend lines you'll generally see that stocks are way above their long-term trend line now but as we see here at least dating back to the last couple of decades we're not terribly above it right now uh, depending on how far back you drag this trend line maybe we're a little above but but most of that excess that happened in the mid 2000s uh, has been burned off at this point we've kind of gotten a little bit closer to a normal trend line they're not totally out of whack It's there. actually gone the other Maybe. way where there's probably uh, uh, more demand than supply, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, if anything, you know, while home prices are high and we'll look into, you know, why that's a problem, it's, but it's not this particular index is not showing, you know, the stress that housing starts do where, why are they not building any houses if, you know, the population has continued to grow? That, that's sort of the bigger question mark that one might ask. Okay. But now let's fast forward to just 2018 to so look at the narrow view. And here we see that some of these longer term trends, if I go back for a second, seem to be slumping a little bit sort of at the tail end. When we zoom in on existing home sales, we see a downtrend throughout the year. Zoom in on the home builders index and housing starts, and we see a downtrend throughout the year. And then lumber prices, we thought we'd look at a more detailed uh, indicator that might be correlated, you would, you know, you would think since lumber is a key input into real estate construction, and that's in fact one of the primary uses in the United States. Um, well, what happened here? Uh, what happened is that actually this spike is owed to tariffs that were put in place 
uh, by the president middle of last year on Canadian lumber. And so since they're a major supplier, that did drive prices up. But what's interesting is that drove prices up, but they didn't stabilize at a higher level. They didn't even stabilize at the same level they were at the prior year. In fact, after that sort of initial rally, lumber prices have effectively crashed and they're now lower than they were back in December of 2017. So that implies that, wait, something else is going on here. Even though there are tariffs, lumber prices have collapsed. So maybe demand isn't what we think it is. So that's kind of, you know, one of the, one of the um, signs deeper in the market that, you know, that we see here. Demand, uh, you should specify, Praveen, demand there, you mean by builders needing wood to build houses. You know, the demand for housing is there. It's just, oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So this the, is the home builders. But the actual building. sales through, yeah, successfully completed sales leading to more construction. You know, this really, you know, if anything, this lumber should dovetail to some extent with housing starts, because if you're not starting new construction, then you're not going to need more lumber. Well, so if that's sort of the, the pulse check of some of those indicators, we see that 2018 looked like a slowdown year. Well, let's start to ask some of the questions about why. And Raj, I know you've made the point that the media has blamed it all on interest rates, but let's go a little deeper on that. Yeah, you know, from the president's Twitter feed to, uh, to all sorts of media outlets talking about these, what I'll call minuscule rate changes compared to the 80s and even the 90s. You know, mortgage rates have been uh, swimming around between uh, somewhere around three and four, basically three and a half, four and a half, four point seven five. You can see at the top of that range, but it's had an uh, exorbitant um, impact on on uh, home purchasing. And so, wh when did that happen? You know, you look at the long term chart on the left there, and that's the same exact graph: new home sales versus mortgage rates. There's zero correlation between that. You know, it's uh, People feel confident. Yeah, only in the early home. 80s when rates were, yeah. I, only when only in the early 80s, late 70s when they were out of control. But other than that, there's not much. Yeah, so now that out of control stuff on interest rates where they're in the high teens, we're, you know, translate that to today. Are people just super entitled because of the uh, low interest rates of uh, uh, post-financial crisis and that kind of quantitative easing time where just no interest rates and, and just now they're just spoiled by that? I don't think that's it, you know, that that's so abnormal, that kind of hypersensitivity uh, to rates, uh, especially when you're making babies or, you know, you're getting married, those normal things that lead to home purchasing. And so, especially starting uh, in 2016, mid-2016, that hypersensitivity to rates, why did that happen? And so, for us, you know, it's become really clear that it's, the lack of affordability, you know, the folks that that hurts on the margin, um, they're not the buyers of those Lux houses, the big Toll Brothers uh, McMansions out there, which were really popular in the 90s, the 2000s, uh, and and the kind of home buying frenzy that happened after the dot com bust. You know that there there is this ongoing theme um, from the post World War II era of uh, of the white picket fence and home as the thing, right? That is the capital accumulation um, mechanism for for U.S., uh, for Americans, right? That's what we do. Uh, and invest in that house, pay that mortgage off quickly, and do that. So that's, those small rate changes shouldn't have mattered, but the fact that there's just no affordability on the edges, those people come off the, the, uh, the home search uh, roster there. And so we'll say, we'll show why that, 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 lack of affordability is there because the the home builders are not building homes like that at all. Right. And then what about buyer sentiment? Because, you know, to your point, there may be buyers that want to buy, maybe affordability is an issue. So it's interesting to look at, um, you know, the uh, big warehouses like the Home Depot and the lows of the world, right, and their performance relative to housing starts. You know, Raj, I used to remember, incidentally, this chart is interesting to me because there was a time earlier in this decade. Um, now, so, you know, for those of you who use hidden levers and kind of know a little bit about how it works, our regression engine, of course, is doing uh, multi-year regressions looking backward in time. And it used to find that Home Depot and Lowe's were correlated with the housing market. And that actually broke down. And if you look at hidden levers, there's no longer a correlation between them. Uh, and say home prices or home sales. Uh, 
Instead, they're basically retailers. And that breakdown kind of tells you something, right? It does. I mean, in this case, uh, it's telling us that the, the folks that can afford the bigger house, you know, they're not first time home buyers. Maybe they're, they've had a couple of kids or they're just trying to, you know, climb up in the economy, promotions, you know, wage, uh, wages are growing. And so they, they could buy something, but now that uh, the, you know, the, the hand has been forced, those 100 basis points on interest rates led to higher mortgage rates. And so the decision comes to, well, I could stay in my home and improve it, uh, or I can, uh, I can trade up. And so because of mortgage rates, kind of uh, because of that sensitivity at, at many parts of the spectrum, uh, you know, middle class buyers, uh, they're also staying put. And so the earnings beats from both Home Depot and Lowe's really shows you that uh, where housing starts are going down and those are going up. Uh, so people uh, staying in their space. Um, the, the one thing that is really um, worrying to me is how much consumer sentiment has been tied to the S&P. You know, since the financial crisis, that ba- the big rise, uh, if you go to a long-term chart of consumer sentiment, it's uh, all over the map compared to the S&P. Again, no correlation, but the, the past uh, decade, it's, it's pretty much right there. And so, you know, that Q4 um, crash that we had, right, that downturn, the, that's why that, uh, I mean, the media did exacerbate it, but consumer sentiment is so tied to the S&P now that when we did have this final three months of, of anything but melt up, uh, there was uh, putting, you know, they put on the brakes on their home search, right? And so um, the the housing prosperity that that we've had for the lo- the last half a decade, right? We read about San Francisco home prices or Manhattan lofts uh, going for a lot, or Brooklyn and and uh, DC, all these big metros really rising. That's just a price rise for for well-to-do people's houses. That's not improving the economy, right? The housing prosperity maybe gives a wealth effect the same way the stock market does, right? It makes people spend a little bit more, but really that's just around, that's just nothing compared to what construction and, uh, and sales of homes were for the economy in the 90s and the 2000s, right? right? That's what really well, matters keep, to- Yeah, I think that, that a real estate starting to become an asset class in a very, um, in that real sense, where they're more like stocks, is start, some of what you start to see in that sense then is that the idea that um, that because real estate prices are rising fast, you know, and we were looking in the modeling briefly, we didn't spend too long with it, but the more leverage you have, one of the things that the model now captures, the more leverage you have. So if you, if you put 20% down on a house and that house rises 5% in a year, well, your returns actually are 5x that. So you can potentially beat the stock market, which makes people feel really good just by buying a house. So they, they really have become an investment asset class. And, uh, and so you start to see those correlations with things like equity. Yeah, we'll talk about that later, Praveen. So the, the lack of, you know, the flippers that were there in the mid 2000s, uh, the early 2000s, that's just not there anymore. You know, they've, the ROI isn't there for them. Um, uh, some, somewhat because of these uh, things. So that, that in and out may be right then, but that, you know, right. buying a home, uh, refurbing it, and then, uh, and then flipping it, that's not happening either. Uh, but the main, the main thing here you want to see is just because the price of some elegant homes in Connecticut or uh, the, the, the well-to-do uh, places that are maybe fed by tech incomes or uh, banking incomes or pharma incomes, whatever that, whatever that is, that, isn't housing prosperity. That isn't. That is, um, that is a wealth effect creation. Housing prosperity would be more construction of homes and more sales of homes. You know, you can see the ripple effect that that would make, right? The jobs, the real estate brokers, the construction workers, um, the, the title companies, everything that goes into that, that, that housing economy feeds, that's, right. that has not broadly enjoyed any of the home price rise. That, that that's only impacted the, the the people that had those houses and most likely they had them for a generation, right? They didn't buy them right. just yesterday. Well, and let's break that down a little further. So we talk about this divergence, this notion that housing is sort of maybe becoming an asset class and it's more divergent from GDP. 
from the idea that, you know, Americans are homeowners. So what are some of the reasons for that? So one of the reasons that we want to talk about is sky high housing PE ratios, if you will. And when we say PE, we're using that a little bit loosely, but there are two ways, uh, two ratios that folks tend to look at. So one is home prices to rent, which is in a sense very similar to a PE ratio, right? Price to earnings versus price to rent. And then uh, the second one is, that typically looked at is home price to median U.S. income as a measure of whether or not Americans are able to buy homes or not. So that's that notion of affordability. Well, if we start over on the left and we're looking at home prices to annual rent, then we see that, no, we're not at the levels we were at in 2006, uh, you know, where both the national and the composite averages were at all-time highs. Uh, but we are definitely rising steadily and and you do see that those large metros are outpacing as well so these have started these these ratios have started to bounce back and as prices are rising again think of this very much like you would think of a pe ratio this means that as these ratios rise actually it becomes relatively better to be a renter than to be a homeowner like when these ratios are very low then that's a good time to buy you know, good time to potentially buy stocks if long-term PEs are low. You know, everyone talks about how if uh, cyclically adjusted PE is low, that's a likely good time to enter the equities market. Or well, in the same way, if price to rent ratios are low, maybe that's a good time to enter the real estate market as we would have seen, let's say here, or in the late 90s before this big boom. But you, you fast forward to today and you get to the opposite impact, which takes me over to the right. At some point, when this number gets high enough, that means that it's actually better to just rent a house than it is to buy one. And, and that's certainly true in a number of the coastal markets where it's so expensive that, uh, that it may be more affordable to rent even the equivalent property. So I'm not talking here about, you know, going more downscale, but even for an equivalent price property, that it may actually be cheaper to rent that property than it is to, to buy. And, so that's, and that's also the case now in San Francisco and Manhattan, right? Absolutely. You're, yeah. You're, you, you typically see rental yields in some of those markets. Uh, sometimes south of 2%. So that implies that folks are willing to um, to rent out their place for as little as 2% annually. Um, that is not a ton of money if you if you if you think about it, uh, you know, relative to to the price point. So that makes its way over into the affordability conversation. It's typically thought that a price for a home. It ought to be less than 4x the median wages in, in you know, in a uh, metro area or, or let's say in the country as a whole in order to be affordable, meaning that buyers can afford to finance that house and have a good probability of paying it back and so on. So that clearly was violated nationwide during the housing bubble and the boom of the mid 2000s. Then we fell back down. But here we are again up near four and a half. So. We have a situation where if prices are rising, and they have been roughly 5% a year uh, in terms in real estate markets nationwide on average. So that's rising 5% a year, but wages are not rising 5% a year. Uh, and rents are not rising quite 5% a year. So neither of those is quite keeping pace. Wages are perhaps falling even further behind. But, uh, but that's what's leading to both this getting out of whack on this price to rent side. And then on this affordability. So, Raj, you mentioned affordability. You know, we talked about affordability earlier. This is really why, on the margin, interest rates matter so much. If you're right near the edge of your affordability line, like you go to your mortgage broker, you go to your banker, and you say, well, you know, I've got this house in mind, and this house is $750,000. And they punch up the numbers, and they say, okay, well, you qualify for 760 given rates today. And then uh, you don't close your loan, you don't lock your rate that day, you lock your rate, you know, you, you go back to lock your rate a week later, if rates have risen 10 basis points, maybe you can't afford 760, maybe it's down to 745 all of a sudden. So that's the kind of like when you're, when you're right around the edge of your affordability, how these small shifts in rates can uh, throw the equation off. And that would explain why all of a sudden the housing market is so sensitive to relatively small rate swings. Because these aren't big yeah. rate swings we're talking about here. In the there's also, an, there's an, you know, hidden in what your, uh, in that example you gave, is this existential uh, fetishization of housing, right? In America, since since the 50s, it's like that's the thing that you do. 
And that's the way you accumulate capital. That's the way you invest your money. You put your hard earnings into that. Uh, and so th- those folks that are, you know, fighting the good fight at 750, they probably would be fine with a, a house that was half a million dollars or a loan that was half a million dollars. It's just, it's just because of the, uh, this American ethos that, that really need it's not interest rates and um, that kind of financial dealings that's going to change that. But I think, you know, what we're looking at in terms of the real blues is I think that era is dead, you know, uh, looking at the reality of this new generation trying to get into that with uh, several drawbacks that, that, um, that concept of, of I am defined by the neighborhood and the home that I live in and the people that are around me like that, that's just not going to happen, you know, for the future. Well, yeah. And we'll look so. at some of the, um, some of, some of those trend changes and buying pattern changes, uh, as we move a little further, but maybe first we could walk through this supply and demand conundrum. You've mentioned, you mentioned it a little bit, Raj, but let's talk about what the builders and what that side of the equation is doing and kind of how that's bounced back and forth. Okay, well, ideally right now you'd have uh, millennials who are, you know, starting to some household formation. They are starting to want houses at least, wanting to be adults, true adults, and have that that life. And, um, the, you know, but there, it's just not there. There's a, such a huge glut of, of Lux homes, of, um, of the McMansions. And so, you know, not only from a taste or style standpoint, where younger people want to be closer to the city, you know, which, uh, which in a generation previously had white flight, you know, now they want to be close to that city, that inner city with the needles and the, the crime. Guess what? That's a hot place to be in almost every city these days. Uh, and so th- that's where builders you'd think would be building. And I guess there are some uh, apartment complexes and condos and whatnot uh, trying, to, trying to fill that gap. But really, it started out in... Um, in the crisis, right? The the slap in the face for the builders was all the affordable housing that was built for newer buyers. Um, that just all went under. It, went, it was uh, underwater, and they all, tons of foreclosures, right? We know that. And that that same demographic that was buying houses in the mid 2000s, they probably weren't supposed to be buying houses, right? It wasn't. It, it was just made accessible to them because of this worldwide hunger for um, mortgage-backed securities. And so they started giving dodgy loans to buyers. You all remember that. But after that 2008 crisis, all, now you've got the pendulum swinging the other way where builders didn't want to risk their neck for those dodgy loans and affordable housing. They wanted to stay in the prime areas, uh, build, build homes that were for wealthy buyers with good credit that are going to qualify for those mortgages. Um, and so that's what they did. They probably overbuilt those, uh, and that's what they have. And now there's no one to buy those. So they kind of screwed, <laughs> screwed themselves over, uh, as well as this, it created this kind of supply and demand dilemma where um, that oversupply doesn't serve the needs of the home buyers that are, are ready and willing to do something today. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, I don't know how this is going to get solved, but the, you see the downturn in the home builder's uh, index there. That's because, and the whole right. starts, they're just, they're kind of a deer in headlights at this point because they can't build the homes that millennials would want um, uh, at the prices that they want and in the places they want. It just doesn't exist, right? They, right. So the, the they market is not to clearing do something totally different. Yeah, the market is just not clearing as well as it should because partly another reason, you know, that we get it, we'll get into a little bit more, but builders found refuge in building for. Uh, more upscale because there's more potential profit margin there. Uh, it, it's actually, yeah. it, it, it has a parallel in the it goes to every company. where you see it's a lot of economics of every company. Praveen. Even think oh, about absolutely. Well, prices, I mean, and, and I was going right? to talk about the parallel to, um, yeah, the parallel to uh, the car market where, you know, you don't see that many manufacturers of economy cars for the same reason. The profits are thinner, whereas you go up market, you know, you have more to work with. And the same is true in the housing market. But in the car market, there is actually increase in productivity. And that's actually something that uh, is not the case. In fact, if I start on that theme, we start on the bottom right of this uh, slide, and then we'll work backward toward the bigger picture on how it impacts GDP. But let's start at the very bottom right, if we if we can, and talk about manufacturing versus construction productivity. So, Raj, you mentioned how uh, 
builders sort of bounce back and forth chasing uh, different kinds of buyers. And um, that's sort of maybe the demand side of the equation now is that millennials might want to buy, but there's no product for them to buy. But why is there no product for them to buy? Well, one of the key reasons is actually embedded in this bottom chart. And that's the fact that this is going back over two decades. This is a McKinsey chart. It's a little bit dated, but it, it remains true. It's actually been true since the 60s, that manufacturing productivity continues to rise. And so does IT productivity and, and many major sectors of the economy. Productivity rises over time. Construction productivity is either zero or negative. So there's no growth in construction productivity. Uh, if you think about this, this makes sense, right? What's changed? over the last many decades in how homes are built in the United States, almost nothing. A plumber who started pl doing plumbing so work back in 1950. Less quality materials, that's the only thing. Well, yeah, that's about it. But, but a plumber who started work in the 50s would more or less understand his trade today. That's definitely not true of somebody in the technology world. It's not true of a doctor. That's not true in many aspects of society, but it's completely true in construction. And that tells you that technology hasn't really made an impact on construction. And that's why there's no productivity growth. Well, if there's no productivity growth, that leads to this second statement. 91% of contractors report difficulty finding labor, uh, which leads you to not be able to build as much quantity, which means with what limited labor you have, you got to focus on the high-end properties. Are you going to invest that labor to build the same number of smaller properties or maybe slightly more of those? Or are you going to build the, the luxe stuff? that maybe you can get more of a margin out of. That's what's yeah. going to drive uh, in that you, direction. Advisors face the exact same dilemma with their own clients uh, and assets under management. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, can you, how do you, how do you profitably serve, you know, the sub 100K segment? You know, that's absolutely a question that advisors face. So it's the same question. And productivity is the answer for advisors using technology. And productivity, hopefully, will become the answer in real estate, but it hasn't made its way there yet. So because of all of these Well, no, problems, the, the answer has been immigrants, right? Illegal immigrant labor. That's how it Well, yeah, it was for a while. And that's another interesting point. It was for a while. And maybe to the extent that that, that, is, that, that supply, labor supply is, is curtailed, we see this contractors reporting difficulty finding labor. Um, but both of these point to something else. So if manufacturing productivity continues to rise, if other sectors you know, across the economy continue to rise in productivity, but construction doesn't, then what will happen to uh, the real estate and housing construction share of GDP. By definition, it's going to fall over time because it's lagging behind. Uh, so back in the mid 2000s, we see, and, and so this chart uh, on the, the major chart on the left hand side shows in gold there the relative contribution of housing to GDP growth quarter by quarter. And you can see the big negative in 2008. And you can see just before then, you know, moderate positive and, and other earlier booms. You can see how it was a nice chunk. But what we see toward the end of the chart here is just sort of diminishing down to the point now where the relative impact of, GD, of housing on GDP is, I don't know, it's getting pretty close to zero. It's a non-factor. And it's a non-factor. And so let's, let's kind of get to the point here up in the top right. So home price is going up 11%. I'm sure the vast majority of your clients are homeowners. So they experience at least part of this rally in home prices, and that part feels good, right? But for the economy at large, this minus 40% in home sales, and both of these numbers are from the peak in 2006 to today. So this minus 40% in actual home sales volume, that's what the economy feels. The product isn't moving, so GDP isn't moving. And that's what these little teeny weeny bars here, that's case in point. There's just no movement in GDP from home sales or from home construction or from anything in the housing sector. And uh, Yeah, and even... Even if every house sold, right, that a builder made, you'd still have home sales downtrending because they're not building as many as they are uh, as they were, right? Right, and that's they, back to again they put the, the brakes inability on the construction to construct market. them. Yeah, inability to construct them, and you know, and we have seen like you know there have been sort of you'll see on YouTube you can find videos if you Google um, 3D printed house and stuff like that that there are these machines that can 3D print concrete. Uh, you know, they're experiments. There's a long way to go, so. It'll be a while before the electricians and plumbers are um, are automated away. Probably decades. Those are, you know, the way American homes are built is just it's, it's difficult to do right now. And so, therefore, where do you get that productivity from? It's not clear, and and that's part of the problem. All right. So we just had a question, which I think that you're going to answer on this slide anyway. But there was a question about millennial student debt and its impact on non-lux 
home demand. Uh, and, and so, Raj, I think you can tie that in because that's one of the topics here. Sure. Uh, I'll start with that. Yeah, good question from David about the correlation between student loan debt and uh, um, how that's affecting their home buying choices. Well, you know, just the last National Association of Realtors report, uh, which was uh, end of 2018, it said something like 50% of home buyers under age 36, which we'll call a millennial for our purposes, um, uh, that student debt was the reason that they're delaying home buying. So that's half, you know, if that answers your question head on. Um, in, in terms of that being one of many secular trends, too many to count, frankly, uh, th this screen uh, uh, covers a, a handful, but you know, housing weakness uh, is our future. I mean, we're paid to predict the future here a little bit. And so just there's too many things that are exogenous, way outside, um, way outside uh, just the, the, the small market of housing in the U.S. housing industry and interest rates, just way bigger things than that uh, that are leading to that housing weakness. And all of them point to that. So, you know, the, those folks that are staying in place, well, it'd, it'd be great, right? You'd see, you see uh, I could get top dollar for my house. I'm a baby boomer. I'm retired and I paid off my mortgage. I'm chilling. Uh, but they're aging in place. That, that, that's happening to too many folks, including Praveen and my parents both, right? Just name those clients of yours that are not downsizing, creating extra money or creating extra value, mo moving the housing economy. They're just aging in place. Uh, and, and they're there probably until... Uh, they're unable to do it, right? So next, golf golf communities dying. You may have heard of this. Uh, you know, uh, golf is kind of a dying sport, right? Um, I think even Nike, who sponsored uh, Tiger Woods uh, in the 90s and maybe even the early 2000s, they don't even make golf stuff anymore. They just ditched that whole biz. And, and l like that, a lot of builders have stopped making golf communities um, the ones that are making communities, I don't know who they're making it for because you can see the trend in golf. And then, you know, the, the values of those homes that are built around those communities um, is, is tanking because no one wants to be forced to pay all those, those extra dues for the golf club that they don't use. Uh, the, the student loan debt, I think there's been too many articles about that now, touching 1.5 trillion, and that's crippling. You can see that kind of the uh, ball and chain those two uh, young ladies are are caring. I mean, that's exactly what it is. Uh, that's that's curtailing um, all their ambitions, not just home purchasing, just living a, an adult life uh, because of, of that noose around their neck. Uh, in in terms of we we talked earlier about the home flippers, and this, they're just not there. And because of those, the home prices now uh, maybe prices are too high where they can't uh, whatever they buy, even the land, it's just too much to uh, put work in, add value, and flip it. Can't do it. Um, We've talked before about emerging markets uh, and the the power of the dollar lately. Well, guess what? That kills the foreign buyer, especially the Chinese buyer. Not to say there's not Chinese corporations trying to get their money out of uh, China into dollars. Yeah, you could you could have big um, companies buying commercial real estate. That's not the subject here. This is residential real estate, and so those foreign buyers um, are definitely drying up. That's what bid bid up, especially these these uh, blue chip markets: New York, L.A., San Francisco. Uh, but the, the biggest one, you know, the one in color there, uh, this is a kind of existential for the United States, decreasing birth rates. Now that could be, uh, you could, you could talk about a host of reasons, uh, not enough room to, to, to have a kid, uh, more women in the workforce or women's empowerment movements, or people just losing interest in that people being too selfish, whatever that is, you've got now full quarter of young people, um, not having you know, delaying marriage and delaying parenthood, right? And so why do I need a house? If I have a bachelor pad forever, uh, I, I only need a house when I have a wife and kids or when there's a spouse and a child involved, right? Other than that, you might as well, you're just asking for more work and uh, weekends, uh, weekends mowing lawns instead of partying with your friends or vacationing on cheap airline flights. All those things that are happening in society outside housing, but definitely contributing to the idea that, Housing becomes kind of like a shackle um, uh, imprisoning you as opposed to uh, this amazing thing about the American dream. And I'm just going to continue the same things that three generations have since the end of World War II, that white picket fence. And uh, I'm going to you know, be in the same, same place and, and my homestead there, right? For every demographic, you can see that 
it's penetrated, you know, delaying marriage and delaying, um, and delaying having a child. But to me, out of the secular trends that makes, makes the future of housing look not that great, it's especially that, you know, we're just, if it's just, uh, uh, double income and no kids people, or if it's single people not even getting married, but they're already delaying that, then that leads to not needing a home really. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's both of those impacts. And the other, the other bit that I would add just to put a number on it, birth rates uh, in the U.S. have collapsed. And just like in many other Western countries, uh, they collapsed here in the U.S. Uh, much later than Japan and Europe, but they collapsed during the financial crisis and they have not recovered. Um, they are still well below 2.1, uh, which is the replacement rate. So the way the United States has traditionally filled that gap for the last couple of decades has been immigration. But immigration as well is relatively, uh, it's been relatively limited uh, politically over the last couple of years. And certainly there are proposals uh, at this point with a gridlocked government, uh, it's unlikely that any new proposals will move forward. But uh, it, it is the case that immigration has fallen uh, in relative terms over the last uh, couple of years as a result of uh, stricter criteria, even within sort of executive decision making capacity around that on how um, ICE and uh, other organizations are on how, uh, you know, immigration chooses to enforce different rules. So given that, um, and I'm talking here about legal and illegal immigration, not one versus the other. It's, it's really, it's both. But so to the extent that, that net immigration is reduced and to the extent that uh, birth rates have not recovered, just doing simple math, that is slowing U.S. population growth, which therefore is leading to less net demand for houses. So that, I mean, I think you're right to call this out as the number one uh, item to, uh, to be focused on here. In terms of secular that's trends, exactly what's that affecting Japan and Europe too, right? We know that already. Yeah. We have those templates before us. Yeah, the extreme case, which is we didn't link to it here, but the the absolute extreme case is that there are um, exurbs or communities in you know the edges of cities in Japan where uh, we're reading about literally five hundred dollar houses uh, because Japan is now at the point where they're losing half a million people a year. Uh, their population is decreasing by half a million per year just because deaths exceed birth. And uh, and immigration, and so therefore, uh, yeah, houses become worthless in that context. You know, certain homes just become worthless because nobody needs to live in them. Uh, not to say that yeah. that time is soon in the U.S., but that is a secular trend uh, for weakness. Uh, I do want to finish up by addressing that question again from David. You know, one one double whammy on um, on the student debt problem is that is the tighter lending standards now, right? You think about the kind of credit you need to get a home loan. And it's probably more in the sevens than the sixes uh, for for basic home loans. And so those folks that are paying back their loans, a they don't have the money to save up for it because of that loan for the for the down payment. And b their credit often takes a ding even if they're paying on time, right? There's the fact that they have the debt uh, the debt burden, but also you know their young people miss their loan payments or they they take an adventure or they they uh, they take a job that where they can't pay that back. So it just sits on the back burner or so they're not paying and that dings their credit. So uh, student loan, the albatross works in a lot of corrosive ways against the uh, young home buyer. Absolutely. Okay, well, some of those so, <laughs> even bigger than that, Praveen, even bigger than those reasons on secular trends, you know, we are a macro uh, research shop on top of this software platform. So, you know, our big take is there's this old paradigm uh about uh home ownership as the thing that you must do to be a good member of society right that definitely doesn't exist in in a lot of places but in america it's been the paradigm since um you know since uh, jimmy stewart and donna reed and so that's just the way it is the white picket fence the same job for 30 years who the heck does that anymore you know that that those paradigms are kind of for work are are out the window so why would it be that way with uh, the, the kind of residential thing? And so that, that defining yourself by the home you own, the neighborhood you live in, that's largely going away for young people, um, uh, especially because uh, there's two big trends now. You know, what, what is a, a driver of home purchasing? Why should I go? What is going to move me to purchase a home? Besides just blatant desire, right, to have that life. Uh, which we're seeing those desires may not be there. 
Well, so one thing we know for sure is we have a huge tax change, right? The regime on taxes changed to where uh, it doesn't make nearly as much sense to buy a home in uh, New York or California or Chicago. And so folks are leaving there at the rate of 100 people plus a day, right? And where are they moving? They're moving to uh, uh, Nevada. They're moving to Texas, Florida, Tennessee, and sometimes Washington State. Uh, the reason is because right. there's no the, the no tax. income tax state. Yep. No income tax state. Those are receivers now, right? And then, of course, uh, some of the red states in the South are receiving all these um, uh, high payers. And so it's just such an interesting thing that's going on. Um, and so that high salt state to low salt state move is definitely happening. You know, you can see that. Um, uh, I think. I think the city of Dallas received 250 people a day for all of 2018. And so, you know, the one thing that to keep in mind there is what's that going to do to pricing? Well, pricing is going to go up in some areas and it's going to go down in others. And so that's the nice thing about our real estate modeling now, because we have the metros, right? You're able to uh, model out a housing scenario that is more nuanced um, than just one generic uh, nationwide index. Let's face it, you know, it's it's, it's too nuanced now. So that's where right. It's not. It's, well, and it's never been one housing market, but now we've got some discrete macro drivers that uh, really break it apart. And to your point, there's the high salt, low salt, and then there's also the climate change aspect, which the climate right. change aspect is going to be between one, states. I mean, yeah, I'm not even sure if if our modeling can handle climate gentrification just yet, because it also goes within the city, right? On the left, you see right, that, yeah. that's it's, uh, Miami Beach uh, around um, around Brickell, right? And the kind of weather they get. And the dollar signs on Miami Beach, if you zoom in on that little area, uh, or South Beach, those have been the most expensive places, right? But they're also the most exposed. And so guess what? Uh, there's places on the mainland in Little Haiti that have been doubling in price, right? And who who's starting to live there? Uh, it would have been the hoity-toity wealthy of uh, Bal Harbor or of South Beach, you know, folks with underbites and tons of, uh, you know, and trust funds. Those those people are starting to buy in Little Haiti, which is kind of ghetto and, and more um, un underdeveloped, right? So they're, they have to decouple that notion uh, of their own status even just because of uh, survival or just, you know, peaceful living, normal living without a wildfire, without a... Right. Uh, well yeah, in Miami, there's a, a it's actually um, even having like a small amount of elevation. So like 10, a 10 foot elevation above sea level or 15 feet, that really drives home value. And so um, for right. those of you who are familiar with that market would be familiar with that impact. But it's absolutely the this case. Is a, to me, this is an excellent topic. If you're an advisor and you're trying to uh, have, a, you know, give unconventional wisdom to somebody who is at a wirehouse or uh, some client that um, may you may be, you know, they may have some money to invest in housing and, and you want something to say about it. Climate gentrification is an incredible concept that is uh, moving at light speed. You know, it has everything to do with the high ground, as Praveen's talking about. It also has to do with moving inland and, the, you know, uh, both the high ground. Uh, just the difference between, let's say, a Dallas and a Houston, it, uh, you know, from people coming from the East Coast, it's all tax free. But guess what? One of the, you know, Dallas is way more high grounded than Houston, which was a, a bathtub uh, three years in a row for the past three years, right? So that that also has an impact on 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 things. Uh, we and it's hard to model that um, exactly, especially because in certain cities, uh, one area will do much better than another area, and people will start to move there and gentrify. Uh, the other thing to take into consideration here is insurance, right? Even if someone has the money to rebuild or they get the money to rebuild from somewhere then will that be an insurable area? If it's a not insurable area, guess what happens right. to home values there, right? So all these are really things to consider as, as your clients um, are figuring out what to do with that second home on the Florida coast or what they're trying to do in uh, Malibu or the Palisades uh, somewhere, you know, the, those, those could be really attractive and they've always wanted that. But, you know, maybe it's just good to Airbnb or, or, or rent it out for a few weeks as opposed to make that big purchase. Right. Uh, so, you know, definitely. These, these macro drivers, though, to me, are going to be much bigger in the future 
uh, or the, even the present into home buying decisions as opposed to just being on the hamster wheel of the, so, you know, the so-called American dream, right? And you, we will have to almost, I think you, you're going to see at some point um, when, the, when the government kind of stops fighting with itself, if, if the government matters again at the federal level, they will address these things with policy, you know, because whatever policies they put in place since the 50s to move housing, the con, you know, home ownership is it. Um, uh, even through the uh, uh, George Bush 43 era, um, it, it isn't that anymore. It just isn't. It's sometimes even more burdensome than uh, it ever has been. Okay. Well, yeah, so let's, let's get talk to the now scenario. about the scenario. And I had jumped kind of right into it, or the, the updated scenario about U.S. housing and the blues that we're experiencing. And uh, so we, as always, we've got a good sort of a baseline scenario and an ugly scenario. And the good scenario, just to, uh, to kind of uh, put a point on, you know, plus 5% Case-Shiller, so that's, you know, national home prices. That's really just a continuation of trend. This is about what we've seen year after year. Uh, this is assuming that because the Fed is putting a break on rates, uh, you know, Chairman Powell has made statements as such, and we've seen it even in the, um, the Fed's dot plot. So basically, their expectations are that rates are not going to rise as fast. The mortgage rates actually come in a little bit from where they are, so settling around 4%. Uh, given that's the case, then maybe that enables another year of the good times, at least for homeowners, for existing homeowners. As we talked about, the overall um, construction and home sector maybe not growing that fast, but at least for existing homeowners, maybe you've got another year in there in, in this good case. And, and, and that is not sort of a low probability event. That's a, you know, it's something that's not entirely unexpected. But the baseline that we're looking at is slightly different from that. And here it really does vary. To your point, Roger, it really does vary about where we're talking about here. If nationally overall, there's a modest decrease in home prices, but that would really be made up more because folks are starting to sell in uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, some of the places that have uh, high state and local taxes where folks are, um, you know, trying to, on the margin at least, get out. Or, or even if that natural process of folks moving down to Florida continues, but as they're selling, they're, um, they're obtaining uh, lower prices than they would have before these changes. And, and one of the things that, you know, that, We've been seeing, and I'm sure those of you advisors that are in those regions have noted as well, is that um, the effect of the 2018 tax changes is essentially being priced into houses now. So there is that downward shift being priced into the fact that maybe you're paying three or five or ten thousand dollars more a year, or maybe even more than that, because you don't get those deductions you used to get. And so, so that would lead to some fall in prices in some of those markets, maybe a you know a small rise in prices in the markets that are the destinations. But overall, that's going to be a relatively slight negative uh, because you have higher priced homes falling in value than in these lower price markets. But in terms of overall U.S. economy, that's roughly a wash. So this is not a huge event uh, in either direction, but something to keep in mind for those whose homes are in some of those higher priced markets. Maybe uh, whatever home price appreciation you had in mind is not going to be as likely now. And then finally, in terms of an ugly scenario, and what would a pessimistic scenario look like? We do think, we do see that it's possible for a major correction of home prices to occur. So without a doubt, that is possible. Not as deep as the 2008 crisis. But here's the other key point. Because real estate never fully recovered in terms of home sales and construction volume, it's not really in a position to wreck the economy. So prices could decline, but that's more of a wealth effect. It's much more similar to the S&P declining, uh, it might reduce GDP in terms of, uh, you know, consumer sentiment and, uh, you know, just sort of that kind of follow-on effect. But it's not actually putting nearly as many people out of work because there aren't that many people at work in the real estate sector like there were 10 years ago anyway. And so, um, so, you, so here it's basically an asset class correction, uh, not a total recession, not nearly the kind of um, devastation that, that would have occurred or that did occur in 2008, more of uh, a sector correction, if you will. And, and that's what we see as, as the ugly case. You could see in that ugly scenario, home price, you know, if, if the amount of consumption that's happening in the country right now uh, takes a big hit because of home prices, 
uh, that's assuming that the homeowners are the only ones consuming uh, or the, the ones that are consuming the most. Um, if we're relying on that, the homeowners, the landed gentry uh, to be the consumers, then home prices will make them consume less. And so you could see a somewhat ripple effect that could get us into a recession only because um, that that same, you know, because of consumer sentiment is so tied up with uh, asset prices right now. Right. But it's it's sort of, but it's not the sort of direct impact that we had when we had foreclo- a foreclosure crisis and a, uh, you know, a devastation in a sector where, uh, to put it in context, at the, at the, uh, the, on the eve of the Great Recession, you had uh, the housing sector contributing almost 7% of GDP. So a collapse in that sector brought something like 5.6 points off of GDP. So that's, that right there is enough to swing you deeply into the negative. Today, housing is uh, less than 4% of the economy. And so the potential for wreckage is therefore much smaller. Uh, you know, it, it might knock us down, again, to very low growth, but it's just far less likely to, to totally derail things. So. Yeah, I mean, you were questioning during the um, assembly of, of today's presentation, Praveen, whether housing market is even relevant to the economic progress at all. You know, to, right, it's, it's become less to GDP so. right. And, and frankly, frankly, that gets back to that long-term picture, you know, productivity, more productive sectors are going to be bigger over time. 